Assalamu alaikum. This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org slash donate. As little as $10 a month can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamdan yaliqu bi jalali wajhihi wa azimi sultanih. اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وكرم على عبدك المصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي uh, all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator and sustainer, who blessed us with uh, the month of Ramadan, the month of mercy, the month of elevation, the month of nobility, uh, the month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the gates of paradise and gives us the chance uh, to, re- to really fulfill the potential of our creation which is none other than to worship and know, and know our Lord of majesty and beauty and perfection, Jalla Jalal. We're looking now at uh, Imam al-Ghazali's book on the marvels of the heart. On the marvels of the heart. And Imam al-Ghazali in this book, he really is identifying uh, the inner dimensions of the human being. And this is extremely important because the scholars of the spiritual path, some say uh, uh, that, you know, it's it's related back uh, to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but they say one of the things is that it's true, whether it's authenticated or not, it's a wisdom that is true. Whoever knows themselves knows their Lord. Man arafa nafsa arafa rabba. Whoever knows themselves knows their Lord. And... Uh, one of the, the challenges in modern life today is that there are so many distractions continuously uh, that a person does not even know themselves well enough, that we do not even know ourselves. We might not be in touch with our own feelings and thoughts and emotions, uh, let alone the uh, inward dimensions, uh, uh, as one of the scholars said, if you knew the universes, and the galaxies that existed within the heart, they are more amazing than the galaxies that you see in the heavens. That the soul, as Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ardah, as he said, تظن أنك جرم صغير وفيك طول عالم الأكبر You think that you're just a little being, a little uh, thing, but within you has been enveloped the greater universe. And someone might say, how can you say that the heart is you know bigger than the galaxies you see how you get like those little little uh flash drives that have gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of information (laughs) and they become in this really small thing but you put it in and you find that there's a whole world inside of there right that's your heart once you tap into it so imam al-ghazali in this book he's uh he's talking about the realities and the marvels of the heart and also goes into detail about the nafs uh, and about uh, the inner uh, enemies that we also have as human beings. That in addition to the shaitan, in addition to the devil who whispers to us, we also have an enemy of our own nafs. Inna nafsa la ammaratun bisu that the nafs uh, continuously incites and commands to evil. And we also have the hawa, which is the caprice, which is sort of the desires that stem from that. And we have worldliness, this place that tries to suck us in so that we forget Allah and we forget the hereafter. Uh, so we have those four enemies, the nafs, the, the hawa, the caprice, the desires that come from that, the devil and worldliness and this worldly uh, gravity that pulls us in. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali says that you have to know these things inside of you so that you know how to deal with them. And you find a lot of people, they have questions about inner thoughts and they have questions about the whisperings of the devil and they have questions about 
this internal dimension and conversation that goes on within them because they want to know uh, how, to, uh, how to overcome. So Imam al-Ghazali talks about different ways of rectifying the heart and he also goes into the description of the nafs and that the nafs has uh, a power that uh, comes from anger and the nafs also has a power that comes from desires and he likens them to uh, the way that uh, a dog, like a guard dog, has this kind of power and also likens the other lower desires of the nafs, uh, like the pig, how the pig just continuously can consume and consume and consume and is never satiated, that the nafs also has these qualities as well. But we'll talk about what, when, uh, mostly what he talks about the heart. Now, the heart is like a mirror. And uh, the mirror needs to be directed towards the lights of revelation and the lights of the heavenly message in order for it to receive the message, in order for it to really be able to take on that message. Just like if you have a satellite and you're trying to pick up a signal, this is back in the day, you know, when people used to have, people don't remember that. Now it's all just plug it in and everything works. Back in the day, you'd move around the antennas, you try and get the signal on the TV. You remember that? But you got to get it right so that you get the proper signal. And in order for us to understand what our Lord wants from us, we have to be able to put aside the, uh, the whisperings of, uh, of our nufus, of our lower selves and of the shaitan, and we have to rectify our hearts so that we can uh, get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, كَمَا أَنَّ الْمِرْآ لَا تَنْكَشَفْ فِيهَا الصُّورَ لِخَمْسَةِ أُمُورِ So there might be five reasons why a heart is not actually being affected by the lights of divine revelation, just like a mirror does not get the image for five reasons. So he says, one is نُقْصَانْ صُورَتُهَا كَجَوْهَرَ الْحَدِيدِ قَبْلْ أَنْ uh, uh, so he says, it might still be that the mirror itself is not smoothed out. So that you have, you know, a mirror is, is a, a piece of metal that's covered by a glass. But if that metal is not smoothed out and properly formed and put in the way that it needs to be, you won't see anything. Right? So just like that, a heart could also not be in the proper shape and it needs to go through some mujahada, some struggle, and some uh, uh, flattening out, straightening out so that it can pick up uh, the, the, the picture. And then he says, وَالثَّانِي لِخُبْثِهِ وَصَدْئِهِ وَكَدُورَتِهِ He said another reason that the mirror, and he's talking about the heart, might not be able to, to see an image is because of its rust and dirt uh, uh, and grime that covers it. So if the mirror is covered with something, then you won't actually be able to see the image. Or if the mirror is rusted or it's filthy, you won't be able to see the image. And if the heart is completely absorbed and consumed in the vices of the heart, it will not be able to see reality as reality. As Imam al-Busiri says, you know, when someone uh, gets a particular kind of, uh, of illness, I can't remember the name of the illness. Uh, a particular kind of illness, I can't remember it, where even the taste of water becomes uh, unpleasant to them. What's it called? Aywa. But what's it in English? Uh, it's a... It's a particular kind of illness that when you drink, a person drinks water and just go, ah, what is that? It's water. It tastes disgusting. And he says, and just like when someone gets, um, what's that thing that babies get, Sidi When they become yellow? Jaundice. jaundice. When someone becomes jaundiced, their eyes become yellow and they start to see things even through a yellow tint. So when the heart is dirty, it sees things in a way that are dirty, which is why people even saw prophets and messengers and fought against them. How could you see, how could you see Jesus, alayhi salam, and fight against him? 
How could you not see the light that was emanating from him? How could you see Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and fight against him? Just like the head rabbi of Medina, when he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't even have a conversation with him. He said, how could you become Muslim? How could you believe in him before you even spoke to him? He said, this is not the face of a lion. This is the face of a prophet. Right? So that's a sign of a heart that, is, uh, that sees properly. Imam al-Ghazali says, the third, is that the mirror might be turned in the wrong direction. You might not be picking up the signal because you're pointed in the wrong way. If someone is not even seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their heart is completely consumed by dunya, they're not going to, to see the proper image. He said the fourth is that it might be covered with something, that there might be a, a barrier between it and the image that needs to be seen. And the fifth is a, a, a person might be ignorant of the, the, the way that even if they want to find the proper signal, they don't know where it is. They don't know how to get to that signal. So those are some of the reasons. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the things that was given to us was the intellect. And that the intellect is uh, a, a gift from Allah Jalla Jalalu that allows us to understand things and to understand the world and to understand our own selves and to understand the purpose of our creation, and that that intellect was aided throughout time and space with the support of revelation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that we as human beings, that we are rational creatures, and that the way that we come to truth is through rationality, is through understanding, and I would recommend for people who are interested more in this kind of pursuit of the... Uh, rational proof behind revelation and behind prophecy and behind the final revelation of Islam to look into uh, the Seekers Hub podcast by Sheikh Hamza Karamali called Why Islam is True and that these major questions of existence are answered very rationally and that's the way of the greatest theologians of Islam throughout time and, 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 and history because Faith is not meant to be irrational. People will say, oh, well, faith, I have faith. You can't really question it. I guess you're not going to understand. But there are certain levels of faith that are supra-rational, that exceed the boundaries of rationality. How can you explain the sweetness of intimacy with the divine, Jalla Jalal, rationally? I have so it's like, how can you explain, the scholars, they, they, they uh, analogize it to the sweetness of honey. So what does honey taste like? Uh, it's gooey, it's really sweet. Okay, well, maybe that sweet, that reminds me of sugar. No, it's not like sugar, but it's kind of softer than sugar, and it's kind of, you know. But then you say, here, you put the honey in that, mm, now I get it. That's the supra ration that you, you go beyond uh, uh, just rationalizing things. Uh, then Imam al-Ghazali also talks about the four, uh, the four types of khawatir. And this is what's, you know, uh, what we'll focus on, inshallah, is that there are four kinds of thoughts. What are khawatir? They are passing thoughts that go through in, uh, th within the human being that lead to uh, desires that lead to things that we determine uh, and when we determine then we intend and then when we intend as Imam al-Ghazali says al al the starting point of deeds are passing thoughts that we have this stream of consciousness that always goes through us we're thinking about things and to a large extent we almost feel like we can't even control what it is that we're thinking about we have the stream of consciousness. Oh, I'm kind of hungry. Oh, I'm thirsty. Oh, what is this person wearing? Oh. And, and, and some people get really caught up because sometimes they'll get a really vile passing thought and they'll say, I must be such a terrible person. Where did that come from? But you are not your khawatir. You are not your passing thoughts. And actually, there's a, a, a conversation among the ulama 
that are you accountable for your passing thoughts? And the answer generally is no. If you do not entertain those passing thoughts to an extent where they become more and more solidified. So Imam al-Ghazali says, فَمَبْدَأُ الْأَفْعَالِ الْخَوَاطِرِ The starting point of doing things, of deeds, is passing thoughts. Oh man, I'm hungry. Oh, okay, I'm hungry. Oh yeah, I am hungry. What should I do? Maybe I should get some water. Where is there water? Near? There's some water over there. Okay, now I'm going to get up and go get the water. But that there's actually a process from that initial thought all the way to the action. So it starts off with a passing thought. ثم الخاطر يحرك الرغبة. Then that passing thought affects your desire. Let me do something. I'm going to get up and do something about it. والرغبة تحرك العزم. Then your desire moves you to be determined. Okay, you know what? I am going to do it. والعزم يحرك النية. And then that determination turns into an intention. والنية تحرك الأعضاء. And then your intention makes you move your, your limbs and, and your body and makes you do something. But you see how the ulama, they thought of all these different levels of, of uh, uh, what you're accountable for. Naam. So then when you have these khawatir, when you have these passing thoughts, a lot of people want to understand where is it coming from? How do I know what is good? How do I know what is bad? How do I know what's coming from me? How do I know uh, what's coming from the shaitan? So generally, there are four kinds of khawatir. It's very important. Some of the ulama, they were of the opinion that ilm al khawatir is a uh, 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 Knowing the uh, origin of these passing thoughts is an individual obligation upon every Muslim. So one of the kinds of passing thoughts comes from the devil. Because we know that the devil whispers the devil can't do anything more than whisper you a passing thought. The devil can't control you. The devil, oh, the devil made me do it. Nah. <laughs> he might have suggested it, but it was you, right? So the devil cannot control a person. We don't believe in any of that. But what the devil does is whispers, hey, maybe you should do that. Hey, man, think about that. Oh, look over there. Oh, think about this. Oh, do this. And then a person either entertains that thought or discards that thought. So the question is, how do we know if it's from the devil? The ulama, they say there's a few indications that let us know if a passing thought is from the shaitan. One of them is that generally, it is something that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that passing thought, you judge it according to the criteria of the sharia. Ah. This beautiful sharia. Ah. And if it comes across as something that violates or contradicts, then you immediately discard it. But then they say, well, how do you know if it's from the shaitan or maybe from the nafs? They say one of the ways that you know it's from the shaitan is that if you start remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it goes away. Or if you say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, it goes away. Or if you uh, discard it and say, no, no, that's displeasing to Allah, I'm not going to do it. It goes away. But then it comes back as something else. Okay, you got to pray. It's time to pray. All right, you know what? I'm, I'm in the middle of working on something. As soon as I finish typing up this page, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go pray. All right. So you stop and, you, and then you say, okay, I'm going to go pray now. Oh, well, what about that email? One more email. Remember that person who responded to you? No, no, no. I, I really should go pray. Oh, but did you check your phone? Did that person call you? No, no I got to go pray. Oh, but maybe you should grab lunch before you eat, before you pray. And then he starts to go, ah, This is the shaitan. Those are passing thoughts that are coming from the shaitan. Why? Because they continuously change. He tries to come at you from different ways. But when he says, It goes away. How do you know the difference between that kind of passing thought and a pa passing thought that comes from the nafs? It's easy. It's easy to identify. It's not easy to overcome. The nafs doesn't change its mind. I want ice cream. No, no, no. It's not good for you. I want ice cream. No, no, no. It's, shouldn't eat ice cream. It's late. I want ice cream. And then you start to have this internal baby. Wah, wah, ice cream, ice cream. That's the nafs. 
And when it calls you to something that's haram, it will. St- the ice cream is just a, it's a harmless, relatively harmless analogy. But it will. The nafs will call you to some of the most vile things. And say no, I want this. No, and you say Audhu billahi min shaitan rajim. It doesn't go away. Oh, someone said, well, I thought I thought if you say Audhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bad thoughts go away. No, whispers of the shaitan will go away. But what is coming from your nafs doesn't go away. So the way that you identify those from the shaitan is that they will generally take you uh, into something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or they will take you away from something that is good to something that is neutral. Or they will try to take you away from something that is better to something that is uh, inferior to what it is, but it's still good. Because the shaitan wants to get you on any level. And the way that you get rid of that is remembering Allah and seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not entertaining those thoughts. The way that you identify the nafs is that it is insistent on the thing that it wants. Oh, but I really want this. Oh, but I really... No. Or if the nafs wants you to look at something haram, just look, just look, oh, quickly. Ah, oh, come on, come on. And it'll, it'll continuously be there. The ulama say, how do you overcome a thought that emanates from the nafs, there is no way to overcome it except with completely silencing it and opposing it and uh, uh, letting the nafs know that it's not in control of you, which is why Allah gave us an intellect so that we could overcome the evil of the nafs. So you say, no, this is bad. This is not good for me. wa <laughs> And oppose the nafs and the shaitan and always disobey them. And if you disobey the nafs and you disobey the shaitan, you will be successful. You say, you know what? And that's why many of the salihin, one of the salihin, he used to love a particular kind of food. For the last 20, 30 years of his life, he would never eat it. Why? I mean, that's a very high level. That's a very high level. We're going to talk about riyadat al-nafs in a little bit. But that's a very high level because... They wanted to always reign in their nafs. So you know what? Maybe I give you a little bit of what you want, and you get stronger, and your voice gets louder, and your influence becomes greater. And then maybe you're going to start telling me more and more of what you want. And maybe what you want is going to go from something that's permissible to something that is disliked, or something that is disliked to something that's impermissible. So I'm going to keep you tied down. I'm going to control you. And that's the way that you get rid of those, uh, uh, those khawatir of the nafs is completely opposing them and doing things that are bitter on your nafs. So if you want to pray and you go, ah, I don't want to, oh, I'm sleepy. The, the Prophet wasallam, he would get up from his sleep like a lion. Right? And, and he would just say, my nafs doesn't want it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Right? So that's something that uh, the way that you oppose the nafs is by just really being strong and not giving into it. There's another kind. So the two that we've looked at, the two passing thoughts that are not good for you are from the shaitan and from the nafs, from your own lower self. There are two kinds of uh, passing thoughts that are blessings. There's another kind of passing thought that comes from the angels. It's called ilham. So, sorry, the first kind is, is waswasa. What comes from the shaitan is called waswasa, whisperings. What comes from the nafs is just the desires of the nafs. What comes from the angels is called ilham, called inspiration. And they say that the way that you identify what comes from the angels is quite easy, is that one, it is something that is good and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it is an encouraging thought, and then it usually occurs when you are in gatherings of goodness or you're engaging in an act of obedience and goodness, and then you're inspired to do more goodness. So you pray, and then you say, oh, you know, I should pray sunnah after this. That's an angel inspiring you. You can do more, because the angels want to help you out. You got this. Come on, keep going. So the angels will whisper that to you, but it's usually something that comes very gently uh, uh, and comes at the end of or towards the completion of doing something good that inspires you to do more good. That's another kind of khafr. 
and that can come from the angels. There's another kind of khatir that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is relatively rare. The khatir that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that cannot be ignored. Is one that takes over a person's life. Is one that makes a person have an existential crisis where they are seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find people like that. Imam al-Ghazali uh, was one of those people where he was, uh, he was so, uh, so uh, overpowered by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from him that it turned his whole life outwardly upside down. Where Imam al-Ghazali said that uh, even doctors would come and visit him because he was just overtaken by something and they would check him and what's going on. And the doctors would say, this isn't a, a medical illness, this is a spiritual state. And Imam al-Ghazali would say, I found no pleasure in anything in life. And he said, I would teach, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one time he was teaching, and he had you know, this full gathering of students and people you know, uh, holding on to his every word, people in admiration of him. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took my speech couldn't even open his mouth and say even a few words. So he said, uh, I left my position in the Nizamiya. I gave my wife and children everything they needed to survive. He said, I have to go, I have to go figure out my state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I might never come back. His intention was never to come back. And then he went for 10 years fixing himself. Just the fruit of those 10 years we're still benefiting from today in this gathering. Radiallahu anhu wa jazahullah khayr al So that's, that's the one that comes from Allah. And Imam al Haddad, radiallahu anhu, another one of the great Imams, he called it the bi'tha. That there's a bi'tha, there is an urge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala casts into the heart. And when that urge is cast into the heart, it becomes overwhelmed with this, uh, not a negative anxiety, but an anxiety, it becomes anxious in finding the truth. And I saw a, a friend of mine actually go through this, a good friend of mine, where he started to just almost like nothing he said would make sense to people. People would be like, oh, did you see the basketball game yesterday? And he would be like, we're gonna die. But not like, you know, and everyone's like, are you okay, man? Like you're really, you're really morbid, right? Um, but he was going through a, a strong spiritual state and he would be praying and he would weep and, and Allah put something into his heart that set him out and, and he went out seeking knowledge and seeking the people of Allah until he found someone who could, you know, guide him. So these are the four different kinds of khawatir and they say when that khawatir comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is in your best interests to focus on it, to cultivate it, and uh, to allow it to take you where it needs to go. And there's a lot of people, like there are people who wake up one day and they just make tawbah. It happens, it's rare. There are people who one night, they'll just, the night before they'll be uh, doing all kinds of, of nonsense, and then the next day they just completely change. Some people they'll just hear one verse of Quran, their, their heart will burst with the light of the Quran. Uh, so those are, are the four different kinds of khawatir so that you can identify when it comes. Where is this coming from? Is this coming from uh, something that is pleasing to Allah? Is this the kind of thought that is very insistent? And uh, is it coming from the nafs and how we deal with it? Is it coming from the angels? And if it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then your life will change. Uh, and it's, uh, as Imam al-Haddad says, he says, this is one of the hidden soldiers of God this urge that he casts into the hearts of those that he wants to bring near. There are people who are like that, that they couldn't, they would lose sleep, they would lose uh, enjoyment in the things that used to be very enjoyable in their lives, uh, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them and, and they were able to find, uh, and it's something that's temporary, it's not something that uh, you know ruins a person's life where they just lose everything, but it's something that uh, guides them to what they're seeking.
نعم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين So we're going to look now at another book of Imam al-Ghazali So we're going to move forward Kitab Riyadhu al-Nafs or Kisr Shahwa So it's three books Okay MashaAllah And this is the summer This is the Qabas And it's like too much to go through طيب. The next book So Imam al-Ghazali After he goes Imam al-Ghazali was uh, يعني, Not only was he uh, uh, An extremely righteous uh, An extremely righteous and, and at the highest levels of piety uh, And honor with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He also was just a genius And that's one of the greatest things When you have piety and intelligence come together You have a lasting benefit for, for the ummah so Imam al-Ghazali, after he talks about the marvels of the heart and identifies you have this nafs, you have the shaitan, and he even talks about in more detail the, uh, the openings that the shaitan comes to a person through, through their desires, through anger, through all of these different things. Then he immediately moves on to what is the next logical thing is how do you break the desire and how do you uh, purify your nafs? So it's called Kitab Riyadhat al-Nafs, the, the book on um, Riyadhat al-Nafs is literally like this spiritual struggle and you know Riyadhat is, is the word now for exercise, but it's like exercise in like the sense of no pain, no gain, where you're really overcoming and you're taming your nafs, Kitab Riyadhat al-Nafs, when you're, when you're taming a wild horse, it's the same thing with one's nafs. And he says, this is uh, an obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Qur'an. قَالَ تَعَالَىٰ قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا We read this all the time uh, you know, in, in, the, in the short surahs of the Qur'an. Whoever purifies their nafs is, is successful. So your spiritual success, your, the success of your faith, the success of your afterlife is in understanding your nafs and finding the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to purify it. And what's the proof in that? The proof in that is that the shaitan is a person of tawheed. Shaitan believes in Allah. Shaitan has yaqeen. But his nafs was so powerful that it took over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted of him. And that's always a danger. Does that ring? Inshallah. That it's always a danger, right? So the shaitan, he was able to do all of these acts of worship and uh, uh, praying. They say that there's not one spot on the earth except that the shaitan made sujood on that spot of earth. That he was elevated into the heavens even before his passing. But then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, humble your nafs. Now you got a real task that you need to achieve. Humble your nafs. The shaitan said, ana khayran min. I'm better than him. No, he should be bowing down to me. You know how many, how many rak'ahs I did for you? Did you do it for... For Allah, or did you do it for you? Uh, so you can feel good about yourself. So you can feel better than other people. So you can feel accomplished. So Imam al-Ghazali says, you have to know this nafs and you have to tame it. Otherwise, you're not successful. And that's a proof from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا The one who purifies it and makes it pure as the way that Allah... Uh, loves for it to be is successful, eternal success. And the one who allows it to remain filthy has truly been humiliated. Now, uh, so by treating the diseases of the nafs, it becomes purified, and leaving it on its own, it becomes uh, uh, ugly and it becomes dirty. Now. And uh, Imam al-Ghazali says the easiest way, the most practical way to identify the path of purification for the nafs, alhamdulillah, it's not abstract, it's not, 
It's beautiful character. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa he said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was truly sent only to perfect noble character. Right? Because all of these things are interrelated. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, لِكُلِّ بُنْيَانٍ أَسَاسٍ وَأَسَاسُ الْإِسْلَامِ حُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ He said, for every building, there's a foundation. And the foundation of Islam is beautiful character. If you look at this amazing hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, he says, صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُ عَلَيْهِ اِتَّقِ اللَّهَ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْ Be mindful of Allah wherever you are. In public, in private, alone, in a gathering. Be mindful of Allah. وَأَتْبَعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا And follow up a bad deed with a good deed and it will erase it. وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ And treat people with beautiful character. So that's the responsibility that you owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be mindful of Him and never be heedless of Him, to obey Him and never uh, disobey Him, to remember Him and never forget Him Jalla Jalala. That's the duty that we uh, owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The duty that you owe yourself, the obligation that you have upon your own self, is that you do not wrong your own soul through sin. So even if a person makes a mistake and sins, which is inevitable, that you follow it up with a good deed to erase it. And then the duty and the responsibility that you have to society and all other created being, beings is to treat them with beautiful character. And that is the way of the purification of uh, the nafs. Right? That is the way of the purification of the nafs. And Imam al-Ghazali says, that every human being has, uh, has certain qualities that are innate and other qualities that are acquired. So some people might be, uh, might trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala easily. Some people might say, you know, Allah is going to take care of it. And that person would be like, I don't know, man, is it going to work out? Give me some, give me some like assurance. Allah is going to take care of it. So some people might innately be trusting in Allah, other people, they might have to acquire it. He says that uh, uh, that is the mujahada, is that there is a jibilla, there are certain qualities and characteristics that are innate within a, a person. One person might be generous, naturally. It's easy for them to be generous. Another person might be stingy, naturally. The person who's stingy is going to have to work really hard on their nafs to train themselves to be more generous to train themselves to have those qualities and characteristics that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in doing so, and in doing so, then they become purified. Some people uh, uh, might be more susceptible to anger. Some people might be more susceptible to impatience. Some people might be more susceptible. But these are all things that when they are identified, then a person has the path that they can begin. And just like we looked at uh, a couple of days ago, the easiest and most complete and most perfect way of learning the qualities and character uh, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and wants from us is looking at the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa If you want to look at his forbearance, right, that, and really if we think about it, it's, mir wallahi, it's miraculous, miraculous, miraculous. We read about it and we hear these stories all the time. And because we know that the Prophet ﷺ was so great, I think we underestimate it. I think we really underestimate it until we experience it. That a man came to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and insulted his family and uh, physically became aggressive with him. This man that the Prophet ﷺ had uh, borrowed some money from, and that the appointment to return the money, to return the loan, had not yet come. So the guy came early. He was not, if you say, if you and I make an agreement and we say, okay, you know what, on July 1st, you give me X amount back. Okay, beautiful, see you on July 1st. And then the person comes on June 28th and say, where's my money? I say, whoa, 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 whoa. We still got a few days. What are you upset about? I should be upset with you for getting upset. Right? But this, he comes early. 
And then he says, you sons of Abdul Muttalib, you don't like to pay your debts back on time. And in addition to that, so that's now insulting a person's honor and the honor of their forefather. And then in addition to that, he grabs the cloak of the Prophet Sallallahu and pulls with such intensity that there is a mark. Like that's intense, man. Like most of us would be like, whoo, it's about to get ugly. Really, that's, that's the vast majority of human beings. Like, you better get your hands off me. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, and the Prophet said, not only that, he has people around him who are willing to completely defend him and do whatever he wants. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he smiles. And he says to Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, Ya Umar, you should ask. And Sayyidina Umar says to the man, he goes, if my eye saw what I think I just saw, you're dead. You just did that to, 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 to my beloved, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You think that you can do that and get away with it, not on my watch. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to Sayyidina Umar Radiallahu Anhu, he says, Ya Umar, you should tell him to ask more nicely and you also should not threaten him. And you, you, should, you can also encourage me to pay in a nice way and you can also encourage him to ask in a nice way. Sayyidina Umar says, Rasulullah, like, I'm... I'm overcome by this anger. And then the Prophet ﷺ, the greatest of all the people of Tazkiyah, right? as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Allah has truly been gracious to the believers when He sent them from among themselves, the Messenger who teaches them uh, the scripture and purifies them. So now the Prophet ﷺ is going to purify Sayyidina Umar. He says to Sayyidina Umar, you have to be careful of letting this nafs ever overtake you. Because the true believer, the one who is connected to Allah and his messenger and the people who are going to be trained by me and purified by me, all of these character traits will be removed from them. So he said, Ya Umar, go and get the money that is owed to him, and you pay it back to him. Not only do, does the Prophet him, is he going to pay this man back, he's going to have Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu do it so that he can do a mujahada against his nafs. And as they're walking to get the money, he says, Umar, do you know who I am? He says, man, I don't know who you are. I don't want to know who you are. I'm just, that's my added. That's not what he says. I don't know who you are. But inside, it's like, man, I, don't, I just want to give you your money and never see you again. And he says, I'm so-and-so. I can't remember his name, but he was one of the great rabbis of Medina, one of the great people of Scripture, and one of the great people of God. And he was considered to be uh, respected. So he said, why would someone like you do that? He said, Ya Umar, we have the description of the final prophet in our Scriptures. And I saw all of the descriptions found in the Prophet Muhammad He said, except one that I needed to test. And that is that the more ignorantly you treat him, the more forbearant he treats you. So I have tested that character trait, and I want you, Umar, to bear witness. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Oh, Umar, I bear witness that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And he became Muslim. But that, if you were in the, the shoes of the Prophet wasallam, who of us could act that way? But there are people who can. There's uh, one of the great people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've met. Someone came to him and started insulting him with the most vile of insults. You this, that, being really aggressive in front of his students. This, that, yeah. The whole time he just smiled. And the guy just kept going. Just, and he just kept smiling. Ah, you do this, you do, how do you do this? Then it wasn't phased. And then the guy just kind of like ran out of steam and he goes, I've said all of these terrible things about you. I have attacked you. I have uh, insulted you. I've done all of that. 
and you, all, you, all your response is, is to smile. Then the man, he said, I'm sorry I said these things about you. What I heard about you must be false because I've only seen beautiful character from you. He was won over without even any words. But who can do that? But that comes with riyadat al-nafs and knowing that the way that you tame and train your nafs is through beautiful character. Al-ilm bil-ta'allum wal-hilm bil-ta'allum that knowledge comes through seeking knowledge and forbearance comes through forcing yourself to be forbearant. You have a particular quality. You need to give yourself little doses of uh, forcing yourself to take on a beautiful quality. So for example, someone is a worrier and someone is maybe that kind of worry manifests itself in, in a way where they don't like to give of their wealth. They don't like to be charitable. So then give a little bit. Like don't give a, if it's hard for you to give a lot, and you, oh, what if this happens? What if an emergency? What if I got this? What if I got that? Like give a little. Push yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Share a meal with someone. Be gracious. Get someone a gift. Train yourself to be, uh, to, to go against that kind of character trait. Or if someone, uh, if someone has difficulty in trusting in their tawakkul, in trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of you and then see the results. And then know that at some point you have to let go. Do your part, but when you let go and you make your dua and everything is now completely in Allah's hands and then everything works out, take the lesson and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, see, I'm taking care of you. So next time, Relax a little. <laughs> You're in good hands, as Sheikh Hamza says. You're in good hands. Uh, but once again, the way to really do that and to understand that and to see it in its fullest and most beautiful capacity is in the character of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And inshallah, after Ramadan, Sheikh Faraz is going to be teaching a class on the Shama'il, on the characteristics of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that would be really valuable if you want to learn the, the fountainhead of all great character. As one of the poets said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Anta ba'd Allahi al-Azim Azimun. You are after Allah the most exalted. You are after the most exalted, exalted about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Duna adna Below the lowest of his ranks are great people. Below the lowest of the great ranks of the Prophet Sallallahu are great people. You got the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, and then here you have great people. So you see everything of goodness in him, Salawatullahi wa Sallam alayhi. Imam al-Ghazali then goes on very quickly to the next book, which is uh, Breaking the Desire. Breaking the Desire. And really we can sum this up very uh, easily in uh, not giving your nafs everything it wants. Not giving your, even if it's permissible. Even if it's permissible, you should not give your nafs everything it wants, which is why uh, the ibadah of fasting is so unique and so powerful because it restrains your nafs in a unique way. Even water, yeah, for a short while, even water. And Imam al-Ghazali says, why? I'm going to make us all uncomfortable because Iflar is soon and everyone's like, what's for Iflar? Right? But Imam al-Ghazali says, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have you withhold yourself from food and drink during the day just so that in the evening you can choose the most delectable of foods to actually, now that you've kind of weakened your nafs, and you've given precedence to your soul over your nafs, you then give your nafs everything it wants at night. That's not the point of fasting. You have, to, you have to keep the nafs, you have to deal with it very diplomatically. So I'll give you a little bit of, you want, but, of what you want, but I don't give you everything you want. Why? You give the nafs everything it wants, and it will destroy you. It will destroy you. 
And we don't do that in any aspect of life. We realize it. If you want to be successful on an exam, you don't just, you know, stay up all night watching YouTube videos. You don't. If you want to be healthy, you don't eat everything that is placed before you. If you want to be successful, you sacrifice. And the same is said for uh, the, the, the success of the soul. Right, so the way that you, you, you do that, uh, as Imam al-Ghazali says, is not giving everything to the nafs. And he talks a lot about the benefits of hunger, the benefits of fasting. And if you look at the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, um, he said that the worst vessel a human being can fill is their stomach. Because a, a lot of issues stem from that, giving in to other kinds of desires that a person might actually be controlled by their nafs and not even know it. So they have to break the desires of the nafs. And one of the things that fasting does is it allows us to do that. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, would go sometimes for months without a cooked meal, just raw food, water, dates. Maybe some fruits, maybe some other things that they had, Allahu A'lam. Mainly water and dates. For months, he sallallahu alayhi wa he said if a person, they should only eat the bare minimum that allows them to keep their back straight. He said, but if they can't do that, then one-third for food, one-third for air, and one-third for drink. Because what happens, as Imam al-Busiri says, uh, that the nafs is like a child and if you continuously give the child everything it wants the child only becomes more and more spoiled and he says literally if you continue to nurse the child a child can go on for long beyond the time that it should be nursing nursing but if you wean the child, it w the child will, will wean. That's the way with the nafs. Okay, you've got enough. Nope. And then, just like the child, the nafs will go, no, but what? And, and you'll feel this internal battle taking place. But then you say, no, no, no. Who's in control? You have to control. As Imam al-Ghazali says, your nafs is like this wild horse and you have to tame it. You have to be the rider on that horse. You don't let the horse control you. And the way that you do that is also by looking at the things that the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, would do. He would live very simply. He would eat very simply. And maybe that's very difficult for us, but we can find somewhere to start from and start there. So you know what? I'm not going to fill my, I'm not going to stuff myself. I'm going to consciously say, you know what? I've had enough. Alhamdulillah. Or uh, uh, in other aspects of life. You don't need 20 pairs of shoes. You don't need all of the nicest clothes all the time. You don't need to give in to your nafs everything that it desires. It is very healthy spiritually and otherwise to say, you know what? I'm good. I have enough. My needs are fulfilled. And I'm not going to let my nafs control me. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he beautify us and ennoble us with the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these blessed nights of Ramadan, in these last ten nights of Ramadan, that he grant us the opening of the Arifin and that he grant us the uh, tawfiq of his righteous servants and that he grant us deeper understanding uh, of the way to him and understanding of ourselves and that he unlock uh, the potential within each and every one of us so that we uh, recognize the opportunity before us and that we're given increasing levels of nearness and that we adorn ourselves with the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and that Allah gives us the greatest of what He gives His righteous servants wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the Global Islamic Seminary. Visit SeekersGuidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service.
Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.